And you know when you hear this voice, then it's time for us to do some history, to do some honor. Today we're running an honorary feature on the man Kofi Annan. Yesterday was exactly five years he departed. He left us. He left footprints. We must explore them. He left blueprints. We must make use of them. Negative and positive. All of them are worth using. There's a way to use negative footprints. Yes. If you can see the negatives and avoid them, use them as case study or examples you're using them. So we need the bad and the good to carve out or map up, map out the journey ahead of us. So stories of great people like this very necessary, very important. Sometimes we highlight their flaws, not because we want to denigrate them, but because we want us to learn from their mistakes as well. Now, Kofi Annan was a great man. He's still a great man because his legacies are still here with us. Great man by all standards. But there's something about the UN. Some of these high offices, yeah, the flaws these people or the mistakes these people commit are mostly not theirs. They are only instruments being used. And when I studied Kofi Annan's story, I realized he was loved more by the Pentagon. He was loved more by the Americans because the Americans felt he was drifted, drifted, drifted towards their agenda and they could use him to actually achieve their aims with regards to their international policies. So he was voted for to become the UN Secretary General massively by America, US, the Pentagon. He was loved. And when America loves you, well, you know, you know how they, they have a way, they have a way of going about it. Now he stepped into the office of the UN Secretary General as the very first black man to ever occupy the office. Till that he holds that record. The very flat, first black man to hold that office. He was a Ghanaian. We are proud about him. We are proud of him. He's proud of us as um, a nation as well. Everywhere Kofi Annan went, he made it known he was a Ghanaian. So till date, his legacies are honor for Ghana than himself and his family. How much of his family do you know? How much of his family do you know? Anytime Kofi Annan is talked about, Ghana is talked about. His legacies are owned by Ghana. We take pride and honor in his legacies much more than his family is immediate. How many of us know his sons? He has, he has kids. He has children. How many of us know about them? The glory comes to Ghana each and every time, anytime we talk about Kofi Annan. But he made some mistakes. As the UN Secretary General under him, the Rwandan genocide happened. He himself admitted he could have done better to curb the situation, but he failed. And he regrets it. Even in his biography, he recounts how he could have done better. You know? But he was working for people. He was working for superpowers. When you are the UN Secretary General, you don't take decision on your decisions on your own. You are working with the Security Council. You are working with the General Assembly. Listen, man. And all of these people will use their consent to actually make moves. So Kofi Annan might want to step in to solve a situation. But the green light, if the green light is not coming from the Security Council is not coming from the General Assembly. He can't make the move. So under his watch, the massacre in Rwanda happened. Under his watch, before his eyes, people were murdered in cold blood in Rwanda. Before his eyes, Rwanda was turned red. Before his eyes. Before his eyes, Rwanda was destroyed. Totally. With human blood, scars of humans, bones of humans under his watch. Till he died, he kept reiterating the fact that he regrets the Rwandan genocide. 
he feels he could have done something better. But that's some amount of honesty. How many of the leaders admit to their mistakes? We have our own Akufuado here. How many times has he admitted to wrongs he has done? His ministers are caught up in scandals. Even before they investigate them, he comes to clear them. He himself has messed up the country. But he doesn't even want to agree. He's blaming Corona. They are blaming Corona and Ukraine war each and every time. They don't want to accept their fault. They don't want to accept their mistakes. How many leaders accept their mistakes? So for even Kofi Annan to admit that, yes, I could have done better. It's some quality of him we must celebrate. Even though all of us regret the Rwandan genocide. The lives of the people in Rwanda should have been saved. Rather than watching them kill each other like they did. But for the man to come after years to admit and express remorse and regret is appreciable. And like I point to you, how many of our leaders accept mistake? Watch you amu gain crown no mu deny that be no mu dich no mu ka grammar. Mwa bokro no daylight, fitana wa chino no dabi. The only as it da or no cabro fuckers here. Was say your mind on mana ya bassa scatter everything turned upside down. Still, or see that be or you know, pumping on your bonny bia or no one you know, we boom mine ye pa. No bian boo mine it is an on webo mine da or no no champion. Bombo clats. But Kofi said no, man. Kofi Annan said no, man. Yes, yes, yes. It happened. But it shouldn't have. I should have done something about it. And that's a quality human trait. And like I highlighted, many of these people are instruments. Yeah? They are only used by the superpowers to achieve their aim. But let me take you into his story. It's a lengthy one, but I will try to summarize it. 39 after 7. We owe nobody apology for speaking the truth. I owe nobody an apology for speaking the truth. No man, nobody at all. Sometimes the words might be strong due to the emotional attachment to the issues that I can apologize for. If I go way overboard with my choice of words that I can apologize for. But for pointing to the reality I owe nobody any apology. And views spilled here on this show are solely my views and not the views of the station. They are solely my views and not that of the station. You're looking for somebody to hold responsible. Look for me. Now, Kofi Annan was born on the 8th of April, 1938. He was born on the 8th of April, 1938. He was a Ghanaian diplomat who served as the 7th Secretary General of the United Nations from 1997 to 2006. Annan and the UN were the co-recipients of the 2001 Nobel Peace Prize. Listen, man. He rose to the highest rank a man could rise to as far as diplomacy is concerned. Lord God have mercy. Kofi Atta Annan. He was the founder and chairman of the Kofi Annan Foundation. As well as the chairman of the Elders, an international organization founded by Nelson Mandela. Annan studied economics at Macalester College. He studied international relations at the Graduate Institute in, in Geneva. He studied management at MIT as well. Kofi Annan joined the UN in 1962 working for the World Health Organization's Geneva office. He went on to work in several capacities in the UN headquarters, including serving as the Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping between March 1992 and December 1996. He was appointed Secretary General on the 13th of December 1996 by the Security Council and later confirmed by the Assembly. I'm talking about the General Assembly. 
making him the first office holder to be elected from the UN staff itself. He was re-elected for a second term in 2001 and was succeeded as Secretary General by Ban Ki-moon in 2007. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about our very own Kofi Annan, who left us exactly yesterday, some five years ago. So yesterday is history. And today, the man in perspective on his story, live here on Y97.9. You can listen to us via online www.yfmghana.com or www.yfmtakwadi.casta.fm. With us, online radio just got better, much more easier, and so much more enjoyable. It doesn't matter where you are, your geographical positioning does not matter to us, we still cut and go through. You could have been all the way inside Jamdam or London, America or China, Japan or Canada, Australia, Switzerland. You could have been all the way inside Madagascar, Haiti or Jamaica. You could have been down here in Africa, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Nigeria, Namibia, Gambia, Zambia, Togo, Niger, 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 Senegal, Tunisia. It doesn't matter where you are. We're pumping from Ghana by reaching out to you from wherever you are. Via www.yfmghana.com. We have three of the YFMs, Akra Kumasi and Takwadi. Choose the Takwadi branch and link up with Aya. Or go straight into Casta. www.yfmtakwadi.casta.fm and experience some quality radio. Now, as Secretary General, Anna reformed the UN bureaucracy. As Secretary General, he reformed the UN bureaucracy. He worked on to combat HIV AIDS, especially in Africa. He launched the UN Global Combat Compact. He was criticized for not expanding the Security Council and four faced calls for his resignation after an investigation into the Oil for Food program, but was largely exonerated of personal corruption. He was clean like that. I told you some of his flaws are not because, are not from coming from him, but under pressure. If you work for these international organizations, you work under pressure. Even African presidents are working under pressure. How much more these people who pick up positions that are working for countries? UN Secretary General Office. Listen, man. The pressure that you work under, you are under pressure from Russia, you are under pressure from America, you are actually under pressure from all the superpowers. They are all pressuring you to do what they like, to do what pleases them. So the kind of pressure Kofi Annan worked under, some of his flaws or mistakes, you might just want to pardon him. So largely he was exonerated for, of personal corruption. When they actually dipped into the, when they did investigations, they found out that he himself was, you know, clean. Personal corruption, no man. No, so. After the end of his term as Secretary General, he founded the Kofi Annan Foundation in 2007 to work on international development. In 2012, Kofi Annan was the UN Arab League Joint Representative, I mean Special Representative for Syria, to help find a resolution to the ongoing conflict in the at the time. Now, when he left the office and got some grant, one found training, he established the Kofi Annan Foundation. It will later be even be become an institute where people go to study international relations or international development. When Rollins left office, he did the same thing. When he got some, when he got grant, he used the money to establish UDS. He never named it after himself. The money used to establish UDS was supposed to be money for Rollins, Jerry John Rollins. He could have used the money for his personal gains. But he decided to invest the money into establishing the University for Development Studies in Tamale and Nyanpala. And uh, Wa. he did not name the school after himself. Jerry Rollins University, he did not do that. But people come to power to meet universities. They did not build new ones. But they want to rename the old ones after their family members. 
When you talk politics, you're vex. He's so clouded with party politics, he does not see reality. When you highlight the reality, he get angry. You come to power to meet universities with names already. But you feel wiser than everybody. So you want to change the name into the name of your family member. Why not build a new one and name it after your family member? When people built the university, they did not even name them after themselves. When Kwame Nkrumah built the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, he didn't name it after himself. It was people who named it after him. What kind of behavior is this? What kind of life is that? You alone, you struggle to force yourself into the history books of Ghana. Allow history to work. Allow nature, history to take its course. You are forcing your name into the curriculum of the people. Pupils and students are forced to learn twisted history. We are changing monies, taking off pictures and rearranging pictures to fit family agenda. We are changing holidays, names of holidays and perceptions or ideology behind holidays to fit family agenda. Why not build a name after your family member? If you build, if you like, name after yourself, nobody cares. You come mash up the thing, the existing ones already, you are struggling to name them after your family members. But because of party politics, some Obia man now and overstand when we talk to them. You think them care about you? Stay there in that ghetto. And be misbehaving because of party politics. You think they care about you? All the looting they are doing, they are doing for their family, their immediate family people. Now when Kofi Annan got, off, got out of office and got some grants, he decided to establish the Kofi Annan Foundation to work on international development. In 2012, Kofi Annan Foundation in, 2000, in 2012, like I told you, he was the UN Arab League Joint Special Representative to Syria to help find a resolution to the ongoing conflict in there around that time. Annan quit after becoming frustrated with the UN's lack of progress with regards to the conflict resolution, you see? He was willing to work, find a lasting resolution. But the UN frustrated his efforts. He got frustrated and pulled out of the operation because he accused the UN, which he had left at that time, he accused them of lack of progress with regards to conflict resolution. Sometimes that's what they do. They frustrate you. To make you look like you are the one not doing the job. Now in September 2016, Annan was appointed again to lead a UN commission to investigate the Rohingya crisis. But he died. Everyone would die. The greatest of greats, they die. We all die. So he died. In 2018, he died. Yesterday marked five years exactly, he died. He was given a state burial, but let me tell you about his early life. He was born in Kumasi, in the Gold Coast, now Ghana. I told you he was born on the 8th of April, 1938. He is a twin. His twin sister, Efwa, died in 1991. They both shared the middle name, Atta. Yes, so Kofi Annan shares the middle name, Atta which in the Akan language means twin. Annan and his sister were born into one of the country's fancy aristocratic families. Both of their grandfathers and their uncles were fancy paramount chiefs. And their brother, Kobina, would go on to become Ghana's ambassador to Morocco. Now in Akan, names... Are given sometimes according to days. In the Akan names tradition, some children are named according to the day of the week they were born. Sometimes, in relation to how many children precede them, Kofi Annan 
Kofi Inakan is the name that corresponds with Friday. So people born on Friday, male, male kids born on Friday are known as Kofi. The day on which Anan was born, Friday. The last name Anan in Fanti means fourth born child. Fourth born child. Anan said his name or surname rhymes with Kanun in English. From 1958 to 1957, Kofi Annan attended the elite Infante Pim, an all-boys Methodist boarding school in Cape Coast founded in the 1870s. <music> Kofi Annan said the school, I mean that particular school, Infante Pim School, taught him that suffering anywhere concerns people everywhere. The school he attended in Fantipim, according to him, taught him that suffering anywhere concerns people everywhere. And this will inspire him to work with the United Nations so as to ease suffering on people everywhere. Inspiration is very important. Be careful where you jack your inspiration from. In 1957, the year Anand graduated from Infantipim, the Gold Coast gained independence from the UK and began using the name Ghana. In 1958, Anand began studying economics at the Kumasi College of Science and Technology, now the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, I told you. It was built by Kwame Nkrumah, but he never named it after himself. It was formerly known as the Kumasi College of Science and Technology until it was named by people who felt it should be named after Kwame Nkrumah. He received, it wasn't named by Kwame Nkrumah's relatives. Seku Nkrumah did not come to name the school after his father. Samia Nkrumah did not come to name the school after her father. It took patriotic Ghanaians who felt that no man. We should name the place after the man. He had done something. You want to come and name after your uncles and your father. You want to do things to, to elevate your, your... Oh, yo, man. Only in Ghana. Only in Ghana. But the school was formerly Kumasi College of Science and Technology. Now Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. He received a Ford Foundation grant, enabling him to complete his undergraduate studies in economics in, Mac in Macalester College in St. Paul, USA. That was in 1961. Anand then completed a graduate, a, an international relations program at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, Switzerland, from 1961 to 1962. After some years of working experience, he studied at the MIT Sloan School of Management between 1971 and 1972. In the Sloan Fellows Program and earned a master's degree in management. Anand was fluent in English. He was fluent in French. He was fluent in Akan. He spoke some crew language as well. The crew languages, people in Liberia and some places in Ivory Coast, they, sp they speak the crew language. And he spoke the crew languages too as well as other African languages. In 1962, Anand started working as a budget officer for the World Health Organization. He rose through the ranks. Kakra, kakra, kakra. When Fiti Wan, Obaya, UN Secretary General, or the kakra, 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 sa, tisa kakra, kakra, na kuko di numun sa. In 1962, Anand started working as a budget officer for the World Health Organization, an agency of the United Nations. From 1974 to 1976, he worked as a manager of the state-owned Ghana Tourism, I mean Ghana Tourist Development Company in Accra. In 1980, he became the head of personnel for the Office of the UN High Commission for Refugees. Yes, in Geneva. Between 1981 and 1983, he was a member of the governing board of the International School of Geneva. In 1983, he became the director of administrative management service of the UN Secretariat in UK. 
1987, Annan was appointed as an Assistant Secretary General for Human Resource Management and Security Coordinator for the UN system. In 1990, he became Assistant Secretary General for Program Planning, Budget and Finance, and Control as well. When Secretary General Botros Botros Ghali established the development, I mean the Department of Peacekeeping Operations in 1992, Annan was appointed to the new department as deputy to the Under Secretary General Marak Golden. Annan replaced Golden in March 1993 as the Under Secretary General of the Department of of the Department after American officials persuaded Botros Ghali that Annan was more flexible and more aligned with the rule that the Pentagon expected of UN peacekeepers in Somalia. You see, that's how America played a role in Kofi Annan eventually becoming the UN Secretary General because they felt he was flexible, he was easy to manipulate, and he was drifted towards the American agenda. He understood the American foreign policy agenda. So Americans actually supported him. They got Botros Gali out and made sure he took over from Botros Gali because they felt he was flexible and more aligned with the role that the Pentagon expected of the UN peacekeepers in Somalia. On 29th August 1995, while Botros Gali was unreachable on an airplane, Annan instructed United Nations officials to relinquish for a limited period of time the authority to veto air strikes in Bo Bosnia. This move allowed NATO forces to conduct Operation Deliberate Force and made him a favorite of the United States. According to Richard, Annan's gutsy performance convinced the United States that he would be a good replacement for Botros Ghali. He was appointed a special representative of the Secretary General to the former Yugoslavia, serving from November 1995 to March 1996. Kofi Annan did not live without criticisms. In 2003, retired Canadian General Romeo Delaire, Romeo Delare, I beg your pardon, was forced, who was forced, who was forced commander of the United Nations Assistant Mission for Rwanda, claimed that Annan was overly passive in his response to the eminent genocide in Rwanda. In his book, Shake Hands with the Devil, The Failure of Humanity in Rwanda in 2003, Delare asserted that Annan held back UN troops from intervening to settle the conflict from and from providing more logistics and material support. Delare claimed that Annan failed to respond to his repeated faxes asking for access to weapons to serve the survey the situation. Such weapons could have helped the Lare defend the endangered Tuchis. In 2004, 10 years after the genocide in which an estimated 800,000 people were killed, Anand said, I could and should have done more to sound the alarm and rally support. Anan admitted to what Delare accused him of. In his own book, Interventions, A Life in War and Peace, Anan again argued that the United Nations Department of Peacekeeping Operations could have made better use of the media to raise awareness of the violence in Rwanda and put pressure on governments to provide the troops necessary for intervention. Anan explained that events in Somalia and the collapse of the Unisom, the second mission, fostered a hesitation among UN member states to approve robust peacekeeping operations. As a result, when the UNAMI mission was approved just days after the battle, the resulting force lacked the troop levels, resource, and mandate to operate effectively. <laughs> That made the situation in Rwanda escalate. More bloodshed, more bloodshed. More hairs rolled. More people died. 
Over 800,000 people killed black against black. Africans against Africans. Incited by dirty Babylon. What were they killing themselves for? Diamonds. God have mercy. But is the African so dumb that they tell you to kill yourself? Listen, what is happening to Niger in Niger? Now France is telling Niger, France is telling Ghana, Nigeria, and other African countries to supply troops to go and fight in Niger for a grant for money. They have money to fight wars, but they don't have money to feed the poor. France does not want to come and do the fight himself. But France is telling Ghana, Nigeria, and other African countries to supply soldiers to go and fight in Niger for them to pay some monies. If you supply soldiers, France will give you money. I think they said $25, $25 million or so. $25 million. So you have $25 million, France, to give to African countries to supply troops to go and fight in Niger for your interest. But the people of Niger under your care are dying out of hunger, the second poorest country in the world. But you're supplying, you are giving people $2 million to go and fight there to protect your interest. Is the African that stupid? Are we that dumb? Nobody is fighting in Niger. Nobody, no soul, nobody is fighting in Niger. Nobody is fighting there. Let no soldier. Those people there are your brothers. They are soldiers too. They are soldiers. If you go and kill your fellow soldiers because France is asking you to do so, France is pressuring your presidents, your governments to ask you to go and do so, yeah, that, that, think about it. Your fellow soldiers are salvaging situations, are trying to, you know, even though we will not support that particular channel or lay, but they are trying to do something because they feel they should contribute. But because soldiers, you know, zombie, yo, zombie, zombie, yo. So when they say march, they march. Move, they move. Move, they move. That's the, that's the terrain. That's how it works for in the military. That's how it works. Your opinion does not matter. But listen, let no African. Our president cannot send troops to Niger to go and fight without our approval. Let not the parliament of Ghana approve troops to go and die in Niger for anybody, for France, nobody. Niger has a lot of minerals. A lot of minerals. But they are the second poorest country because France has been siphoning everything from them. France could not give them $25 million to survive. But they want to offer $25 million to African countries that will supply troops to go and fight in Niger. What nonsense. Now let me wrap up with Kofi Annan's, you know, because it's, it's lengthy. He did operations in Iraq. Under him, a lot of um, policies were, you know, uh, uh, were, were, were enacted, you know, under him. Uh, but let me tell you about his personal life so we wrap up. I, I, a, lot of, a lot about him I can, I can deal with. You know, um, Kofiana has a memoir. I told you about it. In the memoir, he admitted he could have done better to salvage the situation in Rwanda. Now, in 1965, Annan married Titi Alakaja. Alakija. In 1965, Kofi Annan married Titi Alakija, a Nigerian woman from an aristocratic family. Several years later, they had a daughter, Ama, and a son, Kojo. The couple separated in the late 1970s and divorced in 1983. In 1984, Annan married again, Nane. Annan married Nane, a Swedish lawyer at the UN. And a, and, and a maternal half-niece of diplomat, Raoul Wallenbeck. She was a daughter. They have a daughter. I mean, she had a daughter. You know, um, Kofi Annan's second wife had a, has, has a daughter, Nina, from a previous marriage. In 2002, Annan was 
and stood by Otun for Ose Tutu, the second as Asante, uh, the Asante Hene of Asante man as the Busumuru of the Ashanti people, a Ghanaian chief. He was the first person to be ho to be installed, you know, to actually hold this particular title. Kofi Annan is the first Ghanaian to be installed as the Busumuru of the Ashanti people. Annan died on the morning of August 18th, August 2018 in Bern, Switzerland, at the age of 80, after a short illness. Antonio, the UN Secretary General, you know, Antonio, Antonio Gatres, the UN Secretary General, said there that Annan was a global champion for peace and a guiding force for good. His body was returned to his native country, Ghana, from Geneva, in a brief and solemn ceremony at the Kotoka International Airport Accra on 10th September. His coffin, dropped in the blue UN flag, was accompanied by his widow, Nane, his children and senior diplomats from the international organization. On the 13th of September, a state funeral was held for Annan in Ghana at the Accra International Conference Center. The ceremony was attended by several political leaders from across Africa, as well as Ghanaian traditional rulers, European royalty, and dignitaries from the international community, including the UN Secretary General Antonio Gatres. Proud to the funeral service, his body lay in state in the foyer of the same, of the same venue from 11 to 12 September. A private burial followed the funeral service at the new military cemetery at Bema Camp with full military honors and the sounding of the last post by Ami Bogles and a an, an 17-gun salute. Kofi Annan is the man we honor today. Yesterday was exactly five years he left us. He did not just leave us, he left us with legacies. He left us with footprints. He left us proud as a nation, Ghana. Ghana is the only country to supply a black man to occupy that office for the first time. It will forever be in history 